welcome to the Old Time Radio Westerns. I'm your host, Andrew Rines, and let's get into this episode. This episode is going to be Challenge of the Yukon Original Air Date is December 5th, 1949, and the title is Dance at Caribou Creek. Hope you enjoy, and again, thanks for listening. Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King! On you huskies! Gold. Gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Like sky rockets that shoot into the night, now you see them. Now you don't. Yes, when you pour out a bowl full of swell-tasting Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice for breakfast, add milk or cream and your favorite fruit, now you see them, now you don't. So crisp, so tender, so tempting, they disappear in a flash. Mmm-mm. For luscious, nut-like flavor, you just can't beat rice or wheat shot from guns. They're the one and only Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat that come in the big red and blue package with the smiling Quaker man on the front. Mike Foss was seated at a corner table in the Borealis Cafe in Dawson when he saw a man making his way through the crowd in his direction. There was something familiar about him which Mike couldn't at the moment identify in his own mind. But when the man stopped at the table and spoke to him, recognition was instant. Hello, Mike. Judd Sawyer. When did you get here? Shut up. Mind if I sit down a minute? Of course not. Take a chair. All right. Wait. <laughs> kind of surprised to see me. Naturally, I was surprised. When did you get out? Six months ago. And I didn't break out. For old? No, no, I did my time. Got two years off for good behavior. I see. What are you doing now? Working for a living. <laughs> I don't believe it. It's true. I'm foreman in a mine back in the hills. So you went straight. Mining company thinks so. I want me to keep thinking that way. Then the company knows about you having done time? Oh, yeah, I knew they'd find out, so I told them all about it. Said I wanted a chance to go straight. They gave it to me. Well, uh, have you? <laughs> what do you think? Oh, then what are you doing up there working for wages? That's why I came down here to talk to you. Yeah? What about? Look, the company's got a safe up there that's worth blowing. You can round up another fellow to help you. It'll be a small fortune for all of us. Judd, I'm no safe blower. I don't know any safe floors around here. You don't have to worry about that. We got an explosives expert up there who can handle that end of the job for us. I thought you said only three of us would be in on the job. That's right. You won't be in on the split when we get the dome. You don't get it. <laughs> this is a setup. There's a lady involved in this. A lady I'm mighty interested in. A few days later, Sergeant Preston and the Great Dog King approached the camp of the Klondike Mining Corporation, located on Caribou Creek. Night had just fallen, and the lights of the camp blinked in the soft darkness. Instead of heading directly into the camp, the Mountie and his dog made their way to a cabin that sat well away from the others. In response to a knock on the door, their friend Carl Dykes, a young explosives engineer, greeted them. Sergeant Preston and King. Hello, Carl. How about taking in a couple of boarders for the night? <laughs> sure, come right in. I was just fixing up supper. There's plenty for both of us. Come on, King. Ah, hang up your gear on the rack over there. I'll get supper on the table. Thanks, Carl. I thought 
boss, we'd be welcome. You're always welcome, and you know it. Uh, what brings you here, Sergeant? Well, nothing in particular, Carl. Just a routine patrol. Oh, I see. Uh, say, maybe you'd like to attend the dance tonight. Dance? Yes, the first one they've had since I came up here a Why, year ago. <laughs> thanks just the same, but I think King and I'll enjoy your fire instead. But don't let us interfere. You go right ahead. No, no, I, uh, I, I'm not going to dance. No? Alice Wells and Dawson? No, she's in camp, but we've had a little spat. Can't be serious. I don't know about that, Sergeant. I think I should tell you. No, that. Carl, I don't want to get into your private affairs. Anyway, I can't take sides. You see, Alice is a good friend of mine. So are you. All the same, there's something you should know. While we eat supper, I'm going to tell you. I'll leave that to you, Carl. As they ate, Carl Dykes told how Alice Wells, the daughter of the mine owner, had been going with a new foreman named Judd Sawyer, whom he had recognized as a one-time forger. And I... I checked on him and learned that he served his time in prison and is now free. That's right. I know him. Did you tell Alice what you learned about Sawyer? No, I didn't, Sergeant. If he's going straight, I, I don't want him to lose his job. But I did tell Alice I objected to her seeing so much of him. No, I understand that. Knowing Judd Sawyer, I doubt that he's going straight. I wouldn't know about that, Sergeant. He's a hard worker, and he's done well here at the mine. But I think Alice should know who he is. Trouble is, I should be the last person to tell her. Is she going to the dance with him tonight? She didn't say so, but I guess she is. She turned me down. After I finish eating, I'll go have a talk with her. I hoped you would. She'll listen to you. I tried to read from her. As Sergeant Preston and Carl Dykes talked at the supper table, Judd Sawyer was conferring with his friend Mike Foss and another man named Joe Wade. They were in an abandoned cabin a few miles from the mining camp. Foss had just introduced Wade. You told me to bring another man to help me. Joe's okay. You can trust him. Mike and me worked together in the States. <laughs> we did a little time together down there, too. All right, now we get down to business. Yeah. I don't want to be connected to this job. Why? The reasons are personal. The girl? Yeah. I got everything set for you, two. You could have clear sailing. There's a dancing camp tonight. Everyone will be there. How about the explosives engineer you told me about? He won't be at the dance. How do you know? Because I'm taking this girl. He'll be in this cabin. Now, look. Get him. Force him to blow the safe. Bring him back here. But leave his tools so it will look like he robbed that safe. Why do you want us to bring him back here? I want him out of the way. Permanently. Now, hold on, Judd. I didn't bargain for murder. Now, you don't have to worry about that, Joe. Just bring him here and wait for me. When we've made the split, you and Mike can beat it. I'll take care of Carl Dykes. After finishing supper, Sergeant Preston and King left Carl's cabin to call on Alice Wells, the mine ober's daughter. Carl Dykes was in his cabin alone when he heard a knock on the door. He opened it. Good evening. What can... What's the idea of the gun? Get back inside and keep your hands in sight. What's the meaning of this? Come on, Joe, and close the door. All right. I'll search him. Sure. He's not armed. What's this all about? Dykes, we have a little job to do tonight. We need your help. If you're smart, you'll do as I say, Savvy. Just what do you want me to do? Get on your heavy duds and bring along your tools. Tools? What kind of tools? Tools for opening a safe. That'll include a bottle of soup. He means nitro. Oh, I see. The company's safe, huh? Right. <laughs> now, get moving. We've got to finish the job before the dance is over tonight. Come on, he said move. <laughs> Carl Dykes knew that resistance was useless, so he put on his heavy coat and fur cap. Then he picked up a small leather case and turned to the two men. All right, I'm ready. What's in the bag? You told me to bring tools. Is everything you need in there? It's my work kit. One I use all the time. Let's go. Joe, you close the door. I will. Meanwhile, Sergeant Preston and King had been warmly received by Alice Wells. But when the Mountie explained his mission, he felt the air about him literally freeze. Alice, I thought you should know about Judd Sawyer. Frankly, I don't appreciate your coming here and interfering in my personal affairs, Sergeant Preston. I know all about Judd Sawyer. Told my father he'd served time. He did? Yes. He wanted a chance to go straight. Dad gave him that chance. Now you're here to hound him. 
You'd drive him out of his job and he might not get another. What would be left for him then but to continue his life of crime? I have no desire to cause him to lose his job if he's really going straight. But I don't think he has any such intentions. You talk just like a policeman. You policemen never give a man a chance once he's made a mistake. Judge Sawyer made many mistakes. I must ask you to leave, Sergeant. All right, Alice. I'm sorry you feel this way. Come on, Jim. And you can tell Carl Dykes I don't appreciate him sending you here. Now, good night. Good night. Well, the old fellow, looks like we've lost a friend. Let's go back to Carl's cabin and break the news to him. When Mike Foss and Joe Wade disclosed their mission to Carl Dykes, the young engineer said nothing to indicate his unwillingness to obey them. But he was thinking desperately, wondering how he could upset their plan and affect his own release. He remembered that Sergeant Preston and King had returned to his cabin, but it was too much to hope they would do so before he and his captors departed. In view of this, he planned to trick the pair. Just how he planned to do it never dawned on them. Even when they reached the mine office and Carl began rummaging through the leather bag he had brought with him. All right, Dyke. Quit stalling. Fill a hole in the combination of that safe and pour in some soup. I... I can't do it. What do you mean you can't do it? I've forgotten something. I thought it was in the leather case, but it isn't. What's missing? See, you've got plenty of drills there. It's the uh, nitroglycerin. I forgot, but I took it out of here this morning. Joe. Yeah? Look in that case. See if he's telling the truth. Sure. Keep him covered so he don't try any tricks. He's covered. How about it? See any soup? No, he's telling the truth. Dykes, I bet you left it out of there deliberately. Why would I do that? To stall for time. I have a good mind Now, to... hold on. You want this safe open, don't you? Yeah. If you slug me, you won't be able to open it. Now, listen Shut to me while I... Shut up. He's right, Mike. Let's hear what he's got to say. Well, all right. Talk fast, Dykes. There's nitroglycerin in my shack. If you will take me back there, I'll Oh, get no. Him. You're staying here. But I need nitro to open a safe. Joe. Sure. Yeah? You know nitro when you see it? Sure. I know it by the smell of the stuff. Then go back to Dykes' cabin. Look around till you find it. Then get back here on the double. Uh, don't worry, Mike. I'll get it. I'll be back pronto. Watch out for tricks. I have a hunch this guy forgot the nitro on purpose. I'll be careful. When Sergeant Preston and King returned to Carl Dyke's cabin, they were surprised to find him gone. But Preston assumed he'd soon be back, so he made himself comfortable. He removed his red coat and hat and hung them on the rack on the wall beside his gun belt and handcuffs. He was seated before the fire reading a newspaper when he heard the door open. He turned. Huh? Oh, I thought you were Carl Dyke's. Quiet, King. Uh, Carl sent me to get something for him. Where is he? Uh, he was called out on a special blasting job, but he forgot his nitro. Sergeant Preston recognized Joe Wade as a man whose face he had seen many times on police posters. He saw also that Wade kept his hands in the side pockets of his heavy coat. His suspicions were aroused, and he decided to question this man thoroughly. But first, he knew he must get his gun hanging on the wall before the man knew what he was up to. Pending cooperation, he said, Oh, uh, you mean nitroglycerin? I know where it is. I'll get it. As Sergeant Preston got up from his chair and moved toward the rack, Joe Wade saw the red coat, the broad brim Stetson hat, and the gun belt. He understood what Preston was about to do and acted swiftly. Freeze, Marty. What? I have a gun in my pocket. It'll go off if you move an inch. And that's not all. I've heard about your dog. Keep him quiet or I'll put a bullet through him before he can move. Savvy? And if I don't keep him quiet? Then uh, you'll both get it. Take your choice. We'll continue our story in just a moment. Say, fellas and girls, did you ever go up into the mountains and listen to the echo of your voice? Like this. Yodely, 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 yodely. Or like this. Quaker pop rice, Quaker pop wheat, shot from gun. Hey, am I dreaming? 
You're no echo. I am too. Why, an echo always calls back the same words. Oh, but I get tired of always saying the same thing other people say. Hmm. I suppose it would get monotonous. Now, if I could eat the same thing other people eat... I take it you already know that Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice are the famous ready-to-serve cereal shot from gun. Naturally. And Echo hears about them all the time. Oh, they're famous. It seems like everyone loves Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat because they're so tenderly crisp, so nut-like in flavor and downright delicious tasting. Mm, makes my mouth water. And when you top these giant-sized grains of wheat or rice with milk or cream and fruit, it's a dish fit for a king. Man, oh man, I could go for a heaping bowlful. That's how millions feel about Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat. And fellows and girls, the wonderful part of it is they're so good for you. Every bowlful gives you added food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. Yes, for a nourishing breakfast that's super delicious and tenderly crisp and tantalizing, treat yourself to Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. Get both delicious kinds at your grocer's tomorrow. And now, to continue our story. Joe Wade gripped a gun concealed in the pocket of his heavy coat. He had given Sergeant Preston the choice of quieting King or having King shot. Preston knew that King would spring if he gave the word, thus giving him a chance to get his own gun from the holster hanging on the rack. But the Mountie also knew that if he did this, he might save his own life and capture Joe Wade. But that King would be killed. Quiet, King. Leave him alone. <laughs> You're smart, Monty. Now I'll open the door. Tell him to get out of here. Tell him. King, go outside, fellow. Do as I say, boy. Go on, outside. Outside, you mutt. What's your next move? Get on that iron bed over there. Lie down on it. Come on, get a move on. You won't get away with this. Let me worry about that. Keep still while I get your handcuffs. Both pairs of them. Joe Wade took the two pairs of steel handcuffs hanging on the rack with the gun belt. In a few moments, he had handcuffed Sergeant Preston to the iron sides of the bed. Then he searched through the shelves of explosives until he found a bottle of nitroglycerin. Here it is. I can tell by the smell. Now, so long, Mounty. If that dog of yours jumps me as I go through the door, I'll put a bullet through him. If you do, the shot will be heard in the camp... We'll bring someone down this way to investigate. Yeah, maybe you're right. I'll have the dog come back in here. Hey, King. Hey, King. Not outside. Don't be too sure of that. Hey, King. I tell you, he's gone. <laughs> so long, Marty. Joe Wade swaggered out of the cabin and slammed the door. Sergeant Preston was mystified. He knew that King had not understood when he had ordered him not to charge Joe Wade. He knew, too, that King had not understood when he told him to leave the cabin. But where had King gone? Had the great dog caught the scent of Carl Dykes and gone to look for him? This, Sergeant Preston knew, might mean death for both King and Carl. Meanwhile, Judd Sawyer, the mine foreman, called on Alice Wells to take her to the dance. Alice, what's wrong? Oh, it, it's nothing, Judd. I, I have a headache. I can't go to the dance with oh, you. Oh, you promised you'd go. Everyone's expecting you. I, I know, but I... Well, I just can't go. You seem mighty upset about something. Has Carl Dykes been making trouble? Oh, no. No, I haven't even seen Carl. Believe me, I... I just have a headache. Well, I never saw anyone cry like that because of a headache. Hey, what's that? Well, it's a dog trying to get in. Well, I'll open the door and run him off. Come on, get, get out of here. Yeah, come back here. No, no, don't kick him. Here, King, here, boy. Well, do you know this dog? Yes, I know him. Now be quiet, King, quiet. King's a friend of mine, aren't you, fella? I see you. Well, Alice, I'll go on to the dance by myself. I'm sorry, Judd. But have a good time, won't you? Sure, I'll have a good time. Night. Good night, Judd. <laughs> now, what's the matter, King? You seem upset about something. Here, you don't want out. You just came in. 
All right, I'll let you out. For a moment, Alice was puzzled and then annoyed. Though she opened the door, King refused to go out. Instead, he caught the hem of her skirt in his teeth and tugged gently. Don't, King. You'll tear my dress. Oh, I'm beginning to understand. You want me to go with you, is that it? Go? Go? I wonder if Sergeant Preston sent you here. Judd Sawyer, the foreman, didn't go to the dance as he had promised. Instead, he circled the camp and hurried toward the mine office, where from one window he could see the faint glow of a lamp. Creeping close to the window, he raised his head carefully and looked inside. <sighs> see boy's got here, all right. I'll break the news to him. A moment or so later, he entered the mine office. Hey, what? Good. I thought you were going to the dance. Uh, what are you doing here? Listen, both of you, blow that safe and clear out of here as fast as you can. What's the excitement? Sergeant Preston and the Mounties is in town. Now, don't stick around here, because there'll be plenty of trouble when he <laughs> finds out... Judd, don't <laughs> worry about <laughs> Preston. We know all about him. What are you talking about, Joe? Listen, when I went over to Carl's cabin to get... Joe the... Wade told how he'd gone to Carl Dyke's cabin, how he'd recognized Preston and forced him to run the dog out of the cabin, how he'd handcuffed the Mountie to the iron bedstead. So you don't have to worry about him. We'll be gone long before anyone finds. That's right, Judd. Well, well. So the three of you are in on this job. I might have known it, Sawyer. Yeah, I'm in on it, all right, Dykes. But when it's all over, folks are going to think that you blew the safe and skipped out. Dykes knew all along Preston was in his cabin. That's why he left his nitro and sent me back after it. He thought Preston would get wise, which he did. <laughs> but I had the drop on that money. Joe, you made a mistake. Huh? You should have killed Preston. I was afraid a shot would be heard in the camp, even if it was fired in the cabin. After you handcuffed him to the bed, you could have put a knife through him. I don't go for killing Monty's, Judd. It means a rope eventually. It'll mean the rope anyway when they don't find Dykes. If you'd have killed Preston, it'd look like Carl Dykes did it. Happened in his place. You're right, Judd. Joe, you had your chance to shut Preston's mouth and pin the job on this fellow Dykes. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, we're wasting time. You two get down with the job of blowing the safe. Be sure to use plenty of carpet over it and keep down the noise. Hey, Judd, where are you going? To finish Preston. And I'm going to the dance, so I'll have an alibi. See you at the cabin tomorrow. All right, Dykes. Get that drill going. Hurry up. I'll never get away with this. Shut up and start drilling. Sergeant Preston had struggled to free himself until he was exhausted. While he lay back to regain his strength, he heard King. A moment later, the door of the cabin opened, and Sergeant Preston turned his head to see Alice Wells. King raced toward his master, barking with joy. Sergeant Preston! So you went after Alice, eh, King? I thought you'd gone for Carl. Sergeant, where is Carl? What's happened to you? I'll explain later. There's no time now. First, look in the pocket of my tunic hanging on the rack there. Yes, Sergeant. You'll find some keys. Get them and remove these handcuffs. In which pocket are they? What's the matter, King? Oh, someone's coming. Oh? King hears them. Quiet, King. Quiet, boy. There's no time to release me from these handcuffs. Let them go. No, it isn't. King wouldn't growl like that if it were Carl. Never mind the handcuffs, Alice. Take my gun out of the holster. Very well. I have it. I'll go into the kitchen and don't make a sound. King, go with her, boy. <laughs> Quiet, fella. Make no noise, either of you. Oh, Sawyer, I'm glad it's you. I thought someone else was coming here. What are you glad about, Preston? You can release me. A man named Joe Wade got the drop on me. What's the idea of that knife? Preston, you know too much. Joe should have finished you off or he left, but he didn't. So it's my unpleasant job to do it. Take him, King! What? No! Look out for the knife, King! Watch it, boy! Drop that knife, Judd Sawyer! I'll shoot if you don't! Call this dog off! Call him off! Down, King! Down, boy! On guard! Well, the dog brought you here, eh, Alice? Yes, he did. Now, what's the meaning of this, you... You murderer? Evidently, Sawyer's in on the robbery. Robbery? The mining company's safe is being blown right now. Get the keys for the handcuffs and release me. But I don't know. We'll understand. tie Sawyer and leave him here. Get the keys. King kept a close watch on Judd Sawyer while Alice took the handcuffs off Sergeant Preston. Then the Mountie tied Sawyer and prepared for action. Meanwhile, in the office of the mining company, Carl completed the job of drilling a hole in the combination and fixing the charge of nitroglycerin. As he worked, Joe held a gun on him. When he finished, Mike covered the big safe with strips of carpeting. There. That carpeting will muffle the sound of the explosion. I'll set off the charge. You won't get away with it. The monies will get you and you'll hang. Let us worry about that. You set off the charge. Carl realized that he was helpless. He could only do as Mike demanded. He moved to set off the charge. 
And then the door suddenly flew open. Hey, look where you are and don't make a move. Sergeant Preston, come here, you. Hey, let go, let go. With lightning speed, Joe grabbed Carl by the arms and swung him around as a shield. Try and get me in your shoot, Carl Dyke. I'll show that money. The whole thing happened in split seconds. Before either Joe or Mike could draw a gun, Sergeant Preston rushed forward with King bounding into the room behind him. While Preston swung a blow at Mike, King went for Joe, who dropped his hands to defend himself. Then Carl was free to join the fight. Here's one. Here's another. Get this talk away. Call him off. Come, King. Quiet, boy. I got Joe's gun, Sergeant. Good work, Colonel. You two, get your hands up. We give up, Preston. We know what we're doing. Alice, how did you get here? I came with Sergeant Preston. Carl, please forgive me. Are you all right? Oh, sure. The worst saw you, he went to my cabin to kill Sergeant Preston. Thanks to King, he failed. Judge Sawyer is a prisoner in your cabin, Carl. Joe Wade and Mike Foss, I arrest you in the name of the Queen. An hour later, Sergeant Preston, with King lying at his feet, was drinking coffee with Carl Dykes and Alice Wells in the latter's home. Camp's going to be very surprised in the morning when everyone learns about the attempted robbery. Yeah. And they find out the whole thing was planned by Judge Sawyer, the foreman. Story I'm waiting to tell Dad and everyone else is how King came and got me. Why, if it hadn't been for King, both you and Sergeant Preston would have been killed. Well, everyone would have thought Carl killed me, robbed the company, and fled the territory. There's no doubt about that, Sergeant. Those crooks said they intended to put the blame on me. But thanks to King, they failed. What? Why, Alice, it's midnight. Yes, Carl. We still have an hour. How about going to the dance with you? Oh, splendid. <laughs> King, you and I can go back to Carl's cabin and turn in. This case is closed. In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Wednesday's adventure. At breakfast time, if you feel like this... Oh, um, same old thing to eat. Then do this. Rush over to the grocer's and rush back with a package of delicious, nourishing Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. Then pour out a heaping bowl full, smother with milk or cream and fruit, and take a big spoonful. Ah, what tender Christmas. What delicious nut-like flavor. Yes, a real appetite waker-upper. So get out of the breakfast rut. Serve yourself a tempting, delicious, nourishing treat. Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. Look for the big red and blue packages with the smiling Quaker man on the front. Remember, Quaker puffed rice and wheat are never sold in bags or bulk. Listen Wednesday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case of the return of Tom Beckett. When I met Tom Beckett on the trail, I almost thought I was seeing a ghost because Tom had been reported killed in action down in Cuba. There was someone else who was even more surprised than I. And that someone had a good reason for wanting Tom to stay dead. As a result, Tom was knocked out and thrown over a cliff. When I went to rescue him, the fireworks really started. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure Wednesday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and supervised by Charles D. Livingston. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice. The breakfast cereal shot from gun. Your best bet for hot breakfast is Quaker Oats. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Yes, if you want to be a star in sports and school activities, make your hot cereal Quaker Oats. Because Quaker Oats helps grow the stars of the future. You get more growth, more endurance from oatmeal than from any other whole grain cereal. Remember, Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health. From Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice. 
So long. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. This has been a presentation of otrwesterns.com, and we hope you enjoyed. Please take some time to like and rate our shows in your favorite podcast application. Follow us on Facebook by going to otrwesterns.com slash Facebook. Join in the conversation by going to otrwesterns.com slash Discord. And don't forget to send us an email, podcast at otrwesterns.com. This episode is copyright under the attribution, not commercial, share like copyright. For more information, go to otrwesterns.com slash copyright. Have a great day, and again, thanks for listening.